Hey, this is Pastor Allen. I'm the lead pastor here at First Baptist Church of Naples, and we are so happy that you have chosen to join us as we go through God's Word together. God's doing some amazing things here, and we pray that God's Word will transform you from the inside out. Our mission here is to glorify God by making disciples of Jesus Christ of all peoples. And our hope is, is that you are being a disciple that makes disciples. Now, if you don't have a church home, we would love for you to join us either in person or continuing online as we go into God's Word together every week. But if you are a member of another church, we don't want this to be in any way, shape, form, or fashion a substitute for you being connected to your local body. So our prayer is, is that God uses His Word to change you and to change others. So we pray that God will use you and this message for His glory. Have a great day. All right, well, take your copy of God's Word and turn to Mark chapter 12. Mark chapter 12, we're going to begin in verse 28. Mark chapter 12, verse 28. Let's stand as we read God's word. Mark chapter 12, verse 28. The Holy Spirit says through John Mark. And, on the, and one of the scribes came up and heard them disputing with one another. And seeing that Jesus answered them well, he asked him, which commandment is the most important of all? Jesus answered, the most important is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. And the scribe said to him, you are right, teacher, You have truly said that he is one, and there is no other besides him. And to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding and with all the strength and to love one's neighbor as oneself is much more than all the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. And Jesus, when he saw that he'd answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one dared ask Jesus any more questions. Good idea. You may be seated. So here's where we are, uh, you rowdy crew at 1130. Here's the question. Which best describes you? Are you a rule follower, a rule bender, or a rule breaker, all right? Now, psychologists say that most people have an inherent bias either for or against rules. And so some people are completely rule followers. They're compliant, they accept rules, they accept systems, and they insist on precision in following procedures. And so, uh, you know, uh, there are some people like that, okay? Others are rebels who like to color outside the lines, do their own things, and can't stand anyone telling them what to do. And so you can kind of see this in traffic. And so if you've ever come uh, to Livingston from Vanderbilt around school time, around 7, 30, 8 o'clock, you'll see the the lane that's, that's gonna turn to the left, that far left lane. You'll have a long line of people. And you'll see all the rule followers will get over that left lane really early. And so it'll be lined all the way back to Collier, okay? Then you have people like me. And so what I do is I go ahead and get in the middle lane and then wait for the opening and come in. Amen? (laughs) Right? So for you rule followers, you're like, I hate people like you. And for those people like me, you're like, right on, dude. Right on. So the reason I'm talking about rules is this, is because when it comes to Christianity, a lot of people see it as just a set of rules to follow. And and if that's all you see the Bible as being as a rule book, and if that's all you see God as being as some malevolent dictator who comes with a series of rules and rules and rules, then you're really not going to want Christianity. You're really going to struggle with understanding the God of the Bible. And this isn't a new phenomenon. As a matter of fact, the guy who started the Protestant Reformation is a guy by the name of Martin Luther. And Martin Luther grew up in Roman Catholicism. And by his misguided study, he saw that Christianity was a set of rules to follow. And so in that medieval Roman Catholicism, he only saw God as someone that you feared and someone that you dreaded. And so he wrote this. He says, Christ was depicted as a grim tyrant, a furious and stern judge who 
demanded much of you and imposed works as a payment for your sins. Luther says, I did not love, yes, I hated the righteous God who punishes seek, uh, sinners and secretly, if not blasphemously, certainly murmuring greatly, I was angry with God. See, if you live your life thinking that all God is is a lawgiver and a rule giver, and if, you, and if in your mind for you to get accepted by God, to get blessings from God, to go to heaven is follow the rules, then what happens if you follow the rules and bad things happen? Or what happens if you find that you can't measure up to following the rules? And so that's where Martin Luther was. He had views of God and what God wanted that were warped from the reality that was in the scriptures. And so instead of seeing what the Bible teaches, he saw his own understanding that really it was about fear and keeping the rules. Well, here's what you've got to understand. This is the basic Christianity 101, is that Christianity is not based on a set of rules that you keep. But Christianity is a personal relationship with God that changes how you relate to everything. Christianity is not what you do for God. Christianity is what God has done for you and then how you respond to what he has done for you. And so today, that's what we're going to talk about. And as we're looking here in Mark's gospel, we are with Jesus during Passion Week. And Jesus is in the city of Jerusalem. It's during the Passover. Uh, thousands upon thousands of people have flooded the streets of Jerusalem. And the day day that Jesus is, this particular text is Tuesday. Now, normally we think of Taco Tuesday. Well, this Tuesday was Question Tuesday. And Jesus got questioned by three different groups. The, the Pharisees questioned him politically. They asked him questions about paying taxes to the government. And we know that uh, April the 18th is tax day. I hope you're prepared for that, okay? And Jesus says, render to Caesar what is Caesar's, all right? So thank you, Jesus. We have to write a check to the IRS, all right? And under God, the things that are God. So he, he answered the question politically. And then there's a group called the Sadducees we looked at last week, and they didn't believe in the resurrection. That is why they are sad, you see. Um, still getting mileage on that one, still getting mileage on that one. But they didn't believe in an afterlife, and so Jesus told them that God is not the God of the dead, he's the God of the living, you are quite wrong. And so now Jesus has got one final questioner, and this question is a legal question over what does God expect from me? And that's a question that really all of us have in our hearts. What does God expect from me? And so Jesus says that what God wants from us is to love him supremely and love others selflessly based on his love for you. So love God, love others based on God's love for you. So let's unpack that. Number one, love God supremely. Verse 28, we're reintroduced to the scribes. The scribes were the experts in the law. And so here you have a lawyer, an attorney coming to Jesus. So you had, you know, think of the Morgan and Morgan of Jesus' day comes to him. And so here he comes and he's heard Jesus' responses to the Pharisees. He's heard Jesus' responses to the Sadducees. And now he's got a question of his own. Now, this may be a question that he had from his own personal intensive study of the law. And this question, as he has combed through all the law, he asked this one, this one thing was on his mind, which commandment is the most important of all? Now, this isn't the first time a question like this has been asked. It really is a question about if you were to boil it all down, what is the main thing? And so there is actually uh, two rabbis uh, a few years prior to Jesus, uh, two famous rabbis, Rabbi Hillel and Rabbi Shammai, and they were asked by a Roman Gentile. Uh, here's what he said. He says, teach me the Torah while I stand on one foot. And so he put his foot up and, and stood on one foot. And basically, uh, Rabbi Shammai, when he heard this, he picked up a stick and started beating the man and chased him away which is what you do when people ask you crazy questions, right? <laughs> um, so this guy, beaten and bloodied, comes to Rabbi Halal and, uh, and stands on one foot and says, teach me the Torah while I stand on one foot. And uh, Rabbi Halal said that, he said, this is the Torah. He says, that which is hateful to you, do not do to your fellow or to your neighbor. This is the whole Torah and all the rest is commentary, now go and learn it. And so here he summarized everything pretty much as the golden rule, okay? That, that which you don't want, don't do to someone else. Do unto others as you would have them do to you. And so Rabbi uh, Hallel basically said that's the, the Torah. And so this is still the question. And so there were 613 laws in the Torah, 
248 of them were positive, you should do this. Uh, 365 were negative, uh, you shouldn't do that. And then if you added not only the Torah laws, but also the tradition of the rabbis known as the Mishnah, there was over another 600 laws. So there were 1,200 plus laws that the people of Israel, the people of God were to follow. And this man, being an attorney, says, well, what is it that is the most important? Like if you were to boil it all down, what would it be? What's the highest moral good? And so Jesus comes to him with an answer that really would make sense to pretty much everyone who lived in that day. He quoted Deuteronomy chapter six. It's known as the Shema. And the Shema is something that was uh, recited at least twice a day by every Jew in Jesus' day, in the morning and in the evening. It was something that uh, was inscribed on the doorpost, and even to this day, they have, uh, if you go into a person that's Jewish, or you go to Israel, you'll see these mezuzahs, and it has the Shema there, or the pious Jews in Jesus' day, and even today, uh, would wrap it on the forearm on a, in a phylactery or on their forehead, uh, and this was what it would say. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And so the Shema starts out by saying, there is one Lord, and his name is Yahweh. And he is exclusively and uniquely God in a category all by himself. So he has no rivals. He has no equals. And so with that being said, then what does the one true God who has no rivals and has no equals, what does he want? See, in ancient Israel's day, there were many gods, false gods, idols, but there were many religions and the false gods in that day of the Shema, well, they wanted what even the false gods in Jesus' day wanted, the gods of Greek mythology and Roman mythology, and even the gods of our day. What is it that false gods want? Well, the false gods want sacrifice. They want rituals. They want obedience, they want food, they, they want money, and if, if you give them what they want, then you might get what you want. You might get favor, you might get acceptance, you might get good karma. But what does the real one true God want? You wanna know what he wants? He wants love. What is love? love? <laughs> what is love? The Hebrew word love is ahava. It meant dedication, devotion, affection, commitment. It wasn't just a feeling, it was a choice. It was a conscious, active, ongoing decision. It's not just, I did it once and now I can do something else. No, it is an active, ongoing, conscious devotion, affection, and commitment. It's what we saying a moment ago. Jesus, we love you, all affection, all devotion, poured out on you. Now, if you've ever told someone that you love them, maybe you told your kid you love them or, 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 your, or you told your parents you loved them, and, and sometimes they'll ask, well, how much do you love me? And so when I was a kid, I would say, I love you with all my heart. Anybody ever heard that? Well, God says here that you are to love me with all your heart. Well, the word heart there in the Hebrew is lavab, and it in that day, the Hebrew mindset is that the heart wasn't just a muscle that beat fluid through your body, but it was the center of your human existence. It was the place where you would know things, you would know it in your heart, where you would understand it in your heart, where you would discern. You ever thought, you know, that just doesn't sit right with my heart, it doesn't feel right. Uh, it's where you feel emotions, it hurts your heart, it blesses your heart. It's where you make choices that are motivated by the desires of your heart. And so uh, the heart is important. The Hebrew mindset is that it is extremely important. That's why you have to guard your heart. The writer of Proverbs, Solomon says in, in Proverbs chapter four, verse 23, he says, keep your heart or guard your heart with all vigilance for from it flow the very issues or the springs of life that you have to Guard what you allow into your heart. You have to guard your heart. Well, here, God says, I want you to love me with all of your heart. That is, you are to devote your whole life, your knowledge, your understanding, your future, your desires, your affections. You are to, to devote that in love towards God. So all your heart. Then he says, all your soul. The word here for soul is the Hebrew word nephesh. 
It's found 700 times in the Old Testament. It means soul. And the problem is, is that I think in our modern day, maybe some of you have had kids, you think of that movie called Soul. And I think a lot of what, uh, a lot of popular culture, when you think of your soul, it's, it's not necessarily accurate because it actually stems from uh, ancient Greek philosophy. Ancient Greek philosophy taught that the soul is the non-physical, immortal essence of a person that's trapped in a body. And so that Greek philosophy says that the real you is your soul and your soul is inside or trapped inside your body. And so the ancient Greek philosophy say the body is bad, the soul is good. In our 21st century America, we say, I am who I am in my soul, even though my body may not reflect it. And so my body may be one thing, but my soul is something else. Y'all smelling when I'm stepping in here? Well, that is not the mindset of, of, of the scripture here, because when it, the Bible talks about your soul, it's talking about your whole person. It's your force, your energy, your passion, that your engine. It's what gets you up in the morning. It's what gets you in, uh, ex, it's what you think about when you go to bed. And so the Hebrew mindset of the soul is this. You don't have a soul, but you are a soul. So the soul is your whole being. And so when God says you are to love me with all your soul, that is you are to love God with the totality of who you are as a person, body, soul, and mind. And so you are to offer God your entire being out of love. And you're to be more passionate about God than anything else in your life. So all your heart, all your soul, all your strength. Now, the Hebrew word here is mio. Now, not meow, mio. It's, <laughs> I heard somebody meow. <laughs> it's found 300 times in the Old Testament. But when the word here, mio, it, it's translated here as strength. Don't think muscle power, okay? Like some of you guys, you guys got muscle power. And I, I would show you my muscles, but I don't want to rip my shirt, okay? So I'll, you know, some of you, some of you in the room, man, you, you just, you know, you just strut sitting down, all right? And so, but the word strength here is not muscle power. It's actually would be better an adverb. And it's an adverb meaning very or much. And it really, the concept is intensity or muchness. And so when Jesus is quoting the Shema, okay, from Hebrew to Greek, he uses two words to, to understand the concept of miod. And that's why I hear in Mark it says, you love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Jesus here is not adding a word. Jesus is just using two words to describe one word, both mind and might. Mind is intellect, might is strength. And so these are both human capacities and human abilities. And so we are to love God with every possibility, every ability, every capacity that we have. That we are to love God with all of our muchness. That, that means that we are to love God with our education, our giftedness, our talents, our abilities, our backgrounds, our creativity, and our wealth. All that we are and all that we have should be poured out in devotion to God. All right? So that's what this means. And so, according to Jesus... The greatest commandment is to love God more than you love anything else. That God alone is worthy of your devotion, your affection, your commitment. That you are to love God with every fiber of your being, with everything that you are, and that God should have exclusivity in and over your lives. In other words, there should be no secret lovers in your life. See, God doesn't just want a place in your life. God doesn't just want prominence in your life. God wants and deserves preeminence over your life. Now you say, well, that's kind of very self-centered and narcissistic. Like that, that sounds like the, the phrase of a narcissist. Well, it would be very narcissistic if it were anyone other than God making that demand. But he is the one who just gave you your last breath. 
He is the one that is keeping your heart beating right now. He is the one who has given you all that you have and all that you'll ever be. So maybe, just maybe, his demand for absolute allegiance and affection and devotion is something you ought to listen to. So if the, greatest, if the greatest commandment is to love God more than you love anything else, then the greatest sin would be to do what? To not love God more than anything else. Now, this commercial thought, I've not had this thought until this service, so y'all, y'all are blessed, okay? <laughs> We're very selective in our morality. And we put certain sins in certain categories that these are really, really, really bad sins. Now, we're not going to go and enumerate them because if we were to put a list of what really, really is bad, some of y'all would have different diverse, diverse opinions. But according to Jesus, the worst kind of sin, the worst sin imaginable is to not love God with all that you are. Boy, that kind of puts some level playing field, doesn't it? Why? You know the first commandment in the Ten Commandments? You shall have no other gods before me. See, having no other gods before me, that that whole thought is idolatry. Maybe you've heard that word idolatry. It means to love more, serve more, fear more, obey something more than you do God. And you think, well, well, listen, we're 21st century. We 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 don't do anything with idols. I mean, we have American idol, but other than that, we don't really do anything with idols. Like, that's something in like, like lower third, third level countries or people that are out there. Like we don't worship, uh, we don't worship stones and we don't worship sticks and we don't worship crazy things. Like there's a culture right now that worships cockroaches. Okay. That's weird, right? And you're thinking we're not weird. We're sophisticated. We're, we're not people like that, but we worship some strange things. We worship these little balls that, that, that are that are made out of rubber and they're inflated and they have stuff on them and they go into a hoop. <laughs> we worship those. We worship these oblong balls as well that they got air in them and they're, they got rubber and then they got this genuine artificial imitation pig leather on them. And then you, one guy hurls it to another guy and they catch it and then they run for their lives. I mean, we worship that. We, we worship these little boxes that, that kind of light up when you turn them on and tell you all kinds of stuff and even talk to you. And their name is Siri <laughs> or Alexa. We worship these big rectangles on our walls that light up and things talk to us. And, and, and we worship those type of things. We, we worship other people. We worship people, created beings who eat, sleep, use the bathroom, put clothes on. We are scared of them. We live in fear of them. We want their approval. We worship some strange things. Because the sin, underneath the sin, is loving something, worshiping something, serving something more than God. And any time I sin, I'm allowing a competing desire to take the place of God in my life rather than loving God first. And reality is, is that every one of us in the whole world has a heart that is a perpetual factory of idols. That if given a chance, we will replace God with any and every object, person, ideal, or dream. You say, not I. Well, let's ask some questions. What do you right now in your life feel that if you were to lose it, life wouldn't be worth living? What is it that you feel like you must have in life? What do you turn to to find joy and comfort and strength and security and approval? Well, what are those things? See, sometimes we make families our idols. We worship our kids. We worship our spouses. We worship our parents. Sometimes we make career our our God and we worship advancement and we worship our position and we find our identity in what we do. Sometimes we worship money. We worship what money can buy. Sometimes we worship fame and and other people's approval. Sometimes we, we do worship sports and athletics. Sometimes we worship food or vacations or travel. 
The problem is, is that all of these idols aren't necessarily bad. I, nothing that I said was bad. Your family's not bad. Your job's not bad. Your money's not bad. Sports are not bad. But the problem is, is that idols are normally not bad things. They are good things that have been hijacked to be God things. And the problem is, is that these idols make promises they cannot keep. These idols will never be able to truly answer you when you're in a time of need. So if you worship money, and I'm not picking on money, I, I talk about money a lot. You say, why do you talk about money a lot? Because it's a struggle in my life. Listen, this is group therapy. Y'all are just listening in. <laughs> if you worship money, Money will promise you safety, it will promise you security, and it will provide you neither. Well, you say, well, you don't have enough money. If you got as much money as I have, it'll provide safety and security. Listen, when you're on your deathbed, you, can't, you can call out to money to save you from dying, but it will not answer you. Money will promise you contentment. It'll promise you that it will buy things that you've always wanted. It will give you the joy your heart's always longed for. The problem is, is that when you cry out because you are discontent with all the junk you have bought, it will not be able to help you in your time of need. Because an idol cannot do what only God can do. And yet we are fools because we would rather worship an idol than God. See, our love for God will not happen in a vacuum. You're not going to just naturally love God until you understand God's love for you. See, John says in 1 John 4, 19, we love him. Why? Because he first loved us. That all of the Christian life is a response to the love of God seen in the person of Jesus Christ. It's God's love for you that is the driving force of your whole life devotion. It is God's love for you that is a filter by which you live your life. See, when you love God with all that you are, things can and will change in your life. Think of the love relationships you have in your life right now. For me, one of the biggest love relationships in my life is with my wife, April. Been married almost 15 years. When I said I do, and she said I do, we entered into a covenant relationship. And in that covenant relationship built on love and commitment and choices, we now live our lives differently since we've been married. I now view other women differently now since I am married. Another relationship of love in my life is with my children. I love my children. They love me. We're a happy family <laughs> with a great big hug and a kiss from me to you. Don't you say you love me too. You know what I was doing there. <laughs> but because I love my kids and because my kids love me, it changes how I live my life. Listen, when you have the love of your spouse, when you have the love of your kids, it's a filter by which you live the rest of your life because that relationship of love changes everything that you are. And that's what here I'm teaching you is that it's not your love for God, but it's God's love for you that will change your life. And so we love him because he first loved us. And because he first loved us, we love him. And because we love him, it changes how we relate to other people. And so the second commandment, listen, let not your hearts be troubled. It'll be quicker. Even though it should take a lifetime to learn. Is to love others selflessly. Selflessly. Verse 31, this, he says the second command is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. This is based out of Leviticus 19, verse 18. The scribe asked for one command, Jesus gave him two. So buy one, get one free. Why would Jesus give him two when he only asked for one? Because, well, number one, Jesus is God. But number two, in God's economy, you can't really love God if you don't love who God loves. Up until this point in history, no one had ever put these two commandments together. Yes, as I quoted earlier, uh, Rabbi, Hillel, uh, R Rabbi Hillel said that basically the golden rule, do unto others as others do to you, that's the whole law. Some would say the Shema, love God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, would be the greatest commandment. 
Some would even maybe even venture to say Leviticus 8, 19, 18, love, your, love one another, love your neighbor as yourself would be the greatest commandment, but no one until Jesus had ever put the two together. Now, notice Jesus sets the standard pretty high, doesn't he? <laughs> he says, love your neighbor as yourself. You didn't just say, love your neighbor. It's not like Mr. Rogers. Say, love your neighbor as yourself. One thing he doesn't ever command us to do is to love yourself. Now, we, know, we live in a day of, of, of horrible situations of mental health, and some of you right now, you hate yourself. But I will tell you that I think in my mind is that self-hate is actually a form of self-love because it's self-fixation. And some of you right now, you're going through horrible situations. Maybe you are even thinking of harming yourself because you hate yourself. Listen, if that's where you are, get help. Call the authorities. Talk to somebody. We wanna be there for you if you're going through that. But here's the truth. Whether it's you are self-absorbed or you're self-hating, it's still ultimately, I think, a boiled down to us self-love. And Jesus never commands us to love ourselves because we naturally do that. It's instinctive for us to seek our own fulfillment, our own happiness. We all want food, we want clothing, we want shelter, we want protection, we want fun, we want friends, we want purpose, and there's nothing wrong with those things. Now, they can get distorted and you can have disordered loves, but Jesus says you're to love others as you love yourself. There's nothing wrong with loving yourself. You're made in the image of God. So what Jesus is saying here is what Commentator Jason Meyer says, it's like Jesus is telling us to take off our flesh and put it on someone else. That we're to look at them and love them with the same interest we have in ourselves. And so Jesus here is saying, you are to love that person as you love yourself. Wow. So listen to what Jesus has just said. He's just given us two of the biggies. Love God, love others. In Jesus' mind and in the Bible's economy, they are distinguishable. They're not the same, they're distinguishable. First is first, second is second. But in Jesus' mind, they're, even though they're distinguishable, they're inseparable. What does that mean? It means this, you can't say you love God and hate your neighbor. Okay? You cannot have a sign that says Jesus saves and wear a KKK hoodie, <laughs> right? You cannot have one without the other. The proof that you love God is that you love your neighbor. And if you say you love God and hate your brother, you're a liar. You don't like it? Take it up with Jesus. So the natural question is, if I'm supposed to, the second greatest commandment is to love my neighbor as myself, then the big question is, who's my neighbor? Because the answer to that question is either going to determine if this is going to be easy or hard. See, if it's a narrow definition, and it basically says if you just say, well, your neighbor are people that are near you, people that you know, uh, people that you have a relationship with, well, then that's easier. We tend to love people who are most like us because they remind us of ourselves. <laughs> and we love ourselves. But if you only love people who are like you and look like you, you're gonna miss out on a lot of love. And you're gonna miss out on what God wants. Earlier, Jesus was asked this same question by another person. And in Luke chapter 10, Jesus gave the same answers. And the natural question was, all right, I'm gonna love my neighbor as myself. Who's my neighbor? And Jesus gave a story. A story called the Good Samaritan. You ever heard it? And in the Good Samaritan... Jesus defines your neighbor as anyone in the road who has needs or needs help. In other words, anyone you come near. And so with that, there are no limitations. There's no, there's no limit. When Jesus was asked who his neighbor was, Jesus tells a story about a man who sacrificially helped another man of a different race and a different religion. Loving your neighbor is radical. It's radical love in which you love people who may be different than you. 
You're to love people of any ethnicity, of any class, of any religion, of any politics. Let that one sink. <laughs> love people of different backgrounds. Love people who are confused about their gender. Love people who are confused about their sexuality. Love people from different beliefs. Doesn't mean you condone sin. No, I'm not saying condone sin. But you can love the sinner. See, our neighbors are those who live by you. But our neighbors also may be people that are nothing like you. And people that you may not even like. Your neighbor may be your enemy. Your, may, your neighbor may be the person that reports you to your HOA. It's not loving those who are like you, but it's loving those who dislike you, people who hate you, who have wronged you, who have wounded you, and you're to love them, not just with warm thoughts and fuzzy words, but tangible, practical deeds with the same energy, joy, and creativity that you love yourself. I don't know about you, but I'm about to lay down on the floor and cry because I am messed up. Because this is threatening. See, my tendency with the first commandment is idolatry. And my tendency with the second commandment is injustice. Because we tend to mistreat, to use, to abuse, to criticize, to tear people down and manipulate people for our own purposes because we love ourselves too much and we love people too little. So, how could, how can we possibly obey this command? Well, let me give you the answer. The first commandment, loving God, makes the second commandment possible to obey. The first commandment, loving God, takes the threat of the second commandment, loving others as yourself, away. The first commandment, loving God, is the basis of the second commandment, loving others. And so, to the degree that I love God is the degree that I will love other people. So if I love God at 350 degrees, I'm going to love my neighbor at 350 degrees. If I love, my, if I love God at 50 degrees, I'm going to love my neighbor at 50 degrees. Are you going to be hot for God? You cannot be hot for God and cold for your neighbor, and you can't be cold for God and hot for your neighbor. It won't work. Does that make sense? Keller puts it this way. He says, if you take all your self-love and focus it on God love so that God satisfies your every need for hope, love, security, fulfillment, and significance, you will see your self-love transformed and satisfied. Self-love is all about finding satisfaction. If God becomes the great love of your life and satisfaction, then loving your neighbor doesn't become a threat to you. In other words, loving God first enables me to love others best. Okay? How can we fulfill the second? We love God. Now you're saying, all right, how do I love God? Great question. You cannot, as I said earlier, love God without first experiencing God's love. Your love for God comes from receiving the love of God from God. And to the degree that you know God loves you, is the degree that you will love God and love other people. So let's go back to the stove. If your understanding of what God has done for you is 350, then your love for God will be 350. And when your love for God is 350, your love for others will be 350. But if your understanding of the gospel is 50 degrees or 30 degrees or 10 degrees, then your love for God will be 10 degrees and your love for others will be 10 degrees and it'll be cold. That's why we constantly talk about the gospel. Because I gotta be reminded every day that even though I'm a sinner, there's nothing I can do that would make God love me more, nothing I can do that would make God love me less than he loves me in Jesus Christ because he died on the cross for my sins, rose from the dead, and has adopted me to be his child forever. And when I forget that, I don't love God like I should. 
and I don't love you like I should. See, if you think about it this way, God's love is like a conduit. I said this in the last service. I'm about done with the sermon, I'm sorry. I'm going a little long, it's okay. God's love for you fuels your love for him and your love for other people. Have you ever found somebody that you really are struggling to love? Like there's some people that I don't even like. No, it shocks you, okay? And so one of the prayers that I learned, I learned this from Adrian Rogers. And Adrian Rogers said this one time in a sermon. He says, God, I don't like them, but you love them. Would you, God, love them through me? See, when you understand God loves you, and you love God, you love who God loves, and therefore that gives you the strength and the ability to love other people. But it all starts by you understanding God's love for you. A lady in my last church by the name of Pat. Pat, if you're watching, I love you, girl. Pat grew up in a very legalistic church. In her denomination she went to, this is what they said. You gotta follow the rules, be a good person, and maybe God will accept you. So her church taught that, that either you're good enough to go to heaven or you're annihilated when you die. So she became obsessed with following the rules. I mean, obsessed. She even worked for her denomination and rose into leadership. She was setting up all kinds of conferences so people could learn how they could keep the rules. And in her incessant, obsessive desire to keep the rules, she knew she was empty inside. She always worried, am I good enough? Have I kept enough rules? She got so obsessed with that, she left her church. She left the denomination and she went out searching for the truth and she found in her mind, there is no truth, there is no answer, so she quit church altogether. A few years later, she was invited by somebody to the church that I pastored in Sanford. She didn't want to come, but she came anyway, like some of y'all. <laughs> I didn't want to come, but I'm here, and I'm ready for you to be done. I understand, I get that look quite often. <laughs> After a few weeks, she heard the gospel and gave her life to Christ and was baptized. Right before baptism, I got a picture right here. This is an old picture. It's an oldie but a goodie. Back when I wore a white robe. <laughs> I had more hair then, too. <laughs> right before I baptized her, she said something that profound. I wrote it down. She said this. She says, the God I once dreaded, I now love because I know that he loves me. She went on to write a book of poetry about God's love for her. It's called Sim Simple Moments. You know, when you know that God loves you, that empowers you to love him and equips you to love anyone you encounter. That as God has done for me, you desire to do for others. So the scribe heard this what Jesus said, and he says, you know what, Jesus, you're right. To love God and your neighbor is much more than whole burnt offerings. Now, where was this guy at? They were at church, right at the temple. What was going on at the temple? Sacrifices. And this scribe said that loving God and loving your neighbor is more important than sacrifices and church activities. Because he knew that what matters most in life is that you truly have a relationship of love with God and that from that relationship you have a love for others because you can go to church, you can do, you can follow the rules and go to church and have no love for God and no love for people. And what scares me is that I and you can do the same that you can come to church, you can do the church activities, you can follow the rules, you can be a quote unquote good person without any love for God and any love for people and be on the outside looking in. 
Jesus looked at this man and says, you're not far from the kingdom. He didn't say you're in the kingdom. He says, you're not far. There's something else you have to do. And that is you have to go through the door. And the door is standing in front of this man and his name is Jesus. Now, we don't know what the man does. It's a cliffhanger. Some scholars believe that Mark purposely doesn't tell us what this man does as to be an invitation to all of us today for us to make our own decision. Will we choose a list of rules or will we choose the Lord of all? Will we choose a set of rules or will we choose a relationship of love? Will we choose idolatry and injustice or will we choose loving God supremely and loving others selflessly? The choice is yours. See, if you see Christianity as a set of rules rather than a relationship of love, you will choose idolatry and injustice. But if you see Christianity as a relationship of love rather than a list of rules, you will choose the way of Jesus, which is to love God supremely and others selflessly. You choose. The choice is yours. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for your word. Thank you for the patience of your people. And thank you, Father, for the opportunity to say, I love you. Father, thank you for Jesus. And anyone who's in this room or watching online or listens to this podcast later that doesn't know you as Savior, God, would today be the day where they would stop following a list of rules and enter into a relationship of love? God, I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing about his great, great love for us. Thank you for joining us as we go through God's Word together. I pray again that God will transform you from the inside out. So as we say here at first, you have come to church. Go out and be the church. Have a great week of worship. We can't wait to see you soon.